Okay. So we are talking about traffic engineering elements. So this is sort of the things that we need to make sure that we, we look out for when we are doing any kind of analysis, when we are doing any kind of uh, measurement, when we're doing any kind of evaluation. So, so what do you think are the critical elements of traffic engineering? What, what do you think we should be aware of uh, in terms of uh, anytime we're going onto the field, what affects performance of, of traffic? Yeah. The density. Yeah, the density, so density affects it, but density is basically, you're, you're essentially measuring the demand, right? So, so density is a sort of a metric that you want to evaluate for. It's not something that, you know, so yeah, it's an element that we, it's a, it's a quantity that we're going to measure ultimately, but I'm trying to get at like, you know, what's the most fundamental or more fundamental units that actually affect performance. Yeah. The amount of heavy trucks and large vehicles. Yeah. So sort of vehicles would be the thing that I'm would be interested in. What is your vehicle mix? Right. For example. Right. So that would be something I'm interested in, 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 when I talk about traffic engineering elements, I'm interested in what type of vehicles might be out there. So vehicles are important element. And then there are characteristics of vehicles we'd be interested in. So we'll talk about those. What else? What are other elements that affect performance? Yes. Driver characteristics. Yeah, so, so the drivers themselves, right? So again, we will we'll kind of study driver characteristics, road user, road user characteristics more broadly, like how fast they walk, how fast they ride, uh, or, or how fast they drive whatever it is, so all of those things. And, uh, you know, so so just user characteristics in general. So, so it's gonna be user, it's gonna be vehicles. You could look at sort of your environmental characteristics. I don't include too much of sort of roadway characteristics here because those are not sort of traffic engineering elements per se. Those are things that we sort of control as traffic engineers, or something that we could design, that we could address for. So, so traffic engineering elements is that Usually we are interested in elements that we have not as much control over. So here are the things that we're gonna talk about, like you know, definition and uh, objectives, some basic points and some elements. So for transportation elements or traffic engineering elements, let's first talk about what's, what's our mandate in, as a traffic engineer, what are we trying to achieve, right? So what's the, what's one thing that we are, what are some of the things that we wanna, achieve through our design of the traffic systems. And, and obviously safety is the primary objective and then speed, convenience, economy, environmental compatibility. We wanna do all of those things. And, and some of these things obviously are, are not in agreement with each other. They in fact sort of contradict each other in some ways, right? So sometimes uh, there might be a situation and a lot of times actually, where if you try to optimize for speed on an arterial street, for example, that goal or that objective will directly conflict for, with, uh, you know, that objective will directly conflict with safety, you know, because with higher speed come more severe collisions, potentially even more collisions. And, and, and if there are vulnerable road users involved, like bicyclists, pedestrians, those types of users who are not, who do not have the protection of an automobile, those people might be might be at even uh, at a higher risk. So so a lot of times all these objectives are not going to pretty nicely line up, but sometimes they might. Sometimes they they might. Um, so, but if there are conflicts, we we try to optimize for safety. But again, we have to be considerate of the fact that you know we cannot like if everybody just drove at five miles an hour, you know there would be no collisions or there would be very few collisions that are not gonna have um, uh, severe consequences. But the issue with that is that might be an acceptable objective when you're talking about like a city streets in near downtown or whatever, right? Everybody's driving slowly might be an acceptable thing, but obviously we don't want our inter interstate highways where you know the trucks are supposed to be driving hundreds of miles to deliver goods and services. And, and if they're traveling at the same speed, that would be a problem. So, so a lot of times what I'm trying to say here is that these objectives are not, at least the ordering of those objectives may or may not be universal. Obviously safety remains our primary objective, 
But but if there is any kind of conflict, we have to be aware of the context that we are dealing with. Is it a sort of interstate highway that we are dealing with, or is it a city street we are dealing with? Or and then this should give you an idea. This you should probably be aware of something we talk about in CE three twenty one uh, in the introduction to transportation engineering class, which is you know whether the goal is access or mobility. Like what is the function of that road? So when we talk about functional classification. Uh, so, so one one term that I want to sort of remind everybody of is the idea of functional classification, and this is not something we're going to go dig deep into it. But is this something that rings a bell? Any uh, what is what do we mean by functional classification? Yeah, low code collectors are carryovers. Right, right. So local roads. So you talk. Are, are you dealing with freeways, major arterials, uh, local roads, uh, collector collectors that? You know, they basically collect traffic from the roadways. And as you sort of go down the hierarchy, you, you know, the, the street that sort of is right in your neighborhood would be maximized, should be maximized for access for all road users. As you move, even city arterials, I would argue that should be optimized for all road users with maybe potentially lower speed. But then when you move up the hierarchy on the freeways, where there's going to be potentially full access control, potentially there, you could optimize for 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 car speeds and 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 truck speeds and whatnot, uh, because at that point, you know the distances have become so large that you won't expect a lot of uh, pedestrians or bicycle traffic there, right? So so again, all of these objectives, the way we safety is always going to be our primary objective, but how do we handle the trade off between objective would be a function of sort of functional classification. Um, you know, we still want to keep our freeways safe, but again, you know. There we might prioritize speed to be a little bit of a higher priority than potential collisions with vulnerable road users, and, and those things could again be problematic in a lot of times. Like you know, for example, in rural areas, you might, and again, awareness of context, you might be dealing with wildlife, for example, right? So there might not be any pedestrians, bicyclists, but speed control or or some sort of awareness of obstructions on the road might still have to be useful if there is wildlife crossing, for example, right? So, so you might have to design the systems for that accordingly. So, so we always want to prioritize safety and then how we sort of look at all these other things depends on functional classification a little bit. So just being aware of the context. Is that sort of is clear, like, you know, what, what we're dealing with? So again, we, we, we treat that as one of the traffic engineering elements because this is something that as traffic engineers, we don't want to exert a lot of control over. We really want to prioritize safety. This is our mandate from, from all the books and all the elected officials, whoever funds our projects, everything, right? So all of these, so this is kind of, again, it's an element that we are dealing with, right? So safety being the primary objective and and um, and speed and convenience, economy and environmental compatibility. Um, and as, as I was saying, like, you know, these goals don't always have to be in conflict. For example, the environmental compatibility might directly be related to safety because if you mode, make it safe for bicyclists and pedestrians, actually it becomes those city streets, same city streets become safer for, for cars as well because again, you're driving slowly, you're paying attention and, and that basically improves safety for all road users, not just for... So again, some of these conflicts might be completely in sync with each other. Some of them might be in conflict with each other. So let's see, next slide. Okay, next slide. So, so this is sort of like a flow chart of the process of what happens in the life of a, a transportation uh, project, you can say. Or, or if you're a city public works person, city traffic engineer, city transportation, you know, person who, who is in charge of this, this is sort of the process that we follow. And in a lot of places, there is more role for traffic engineering. And then there is some places where there is not as much role for traffic engineers. For example, traffic engineers have a pretty prominent role in operations, in, in traffic operations, in maintenance, the traffic engineers play a lot of a uh, pretty significant role. Uh, for example, in maintenance, we have to look at work zone traffic. 
right? So what's, how, do we, how are we going to manage work zone traffic? What are our detours going to look like? What's going to be the lane closure uh, uh, arrangement, right? So there is a lot of traffic engineering elements that go into it. Now, in this class, we're not necessarily going to talk a lot about what happens in a work zone specifically, but we are going to learn the principles of safety, principles of traffic operations. How do we do lane taper, for example? Those elements can, again, be used for work zones as well when you do any kind of implement any kind of lane closures. But again, we're not going to focus specifically on work zone a lot in the class. Again, it's just a 10-week class. But again, we are going to pick up on principles and ideas that could potentially be applicable even on the work zone. But again, the major point here is that this is an area, operations, traffic maintenance, this box right here, it's pretty prominent role for traffic engineering. Right. Um, and then there is in planning, traffic engineers have some role planning. Um, it's not as much of a major role if you're talking about the long range planning, then we are doing a lot of travel demand modeling and all of those things. But again, even within the travel demand modeling realm, when you're talking about sort of validating travel demand models, right? So validation of travel demand models require us to be using the data collected, traffic volume data that's being collected on city streets, for example, right? So, so th that's where you know traffic engineers would have some role to play in providing that data, uh, accounting for that data, and obviously all of these fall under transportation planners, transportation engineering purview. But but for specifically for traffic engineers, they would probably contribute traffic data, maybe even some historical collision data. They would help out with those processes, even in the planning stages. And then obviously in design, you will see there would be, and I'm going to try to, this is something that's pretty easy. There are a lot of elements of highway design, geometric design, roadway design that that follow all the purview of traffic engineers, right? So, so sometimes that line could be pretty, pretty hard to draw. What's traffic engineering versus what's highway design, for example. Um, you know, when you're doing level of service analysis, you could always sort of look at those level of service problems as sort of an evaluation problem, but then they could also be sort of planning design problem where you might think about, might want to think about questions such as, okay, when do I add a third lane or when do I need to take away this lane uh, to, uh, or, or what happens when I take away this lane and make space for bike lanes, right? So all of those questions, right? Those are design questions, but then they are also traffic engineering questions. So sometimes the, the line between the geometric design and traffic engineering could be fuzzy. And I'll, I'll talk about in today's lecture, I'll talk about some things that I'm gonna specifically leave for, for geometric design class, like CE422. But then, you know, easily you could have addressed those questions here as well, because you know, those questions are clearly of interest to the traffic engineers as well. So, so again, you have to be flexible in what your role is. Sometimes you might have to engage with these other elements. And then once we do the operational, we, when we are sort of experienced the transportation system, there is role for research as well, right? You know, what, what are we going to do? How does the practice actually change as, as a transportation engineer, as a traffic engineer? Research is what contributes in, in changing of the, of the practice, right? And that research could be that the research that's done to, to, to shift the highway, safe, highway capacity manual, for example, so highway capacity manual, every few years, a new edition comes out and that's based on new research, right? They are looking at how these new vehicles are functioning, for example, what is their newest, what is what are our newest vehicles capable of? So those kind of things help us out in figuring out what should our highway capacity manual chapters look like and what should they look like? So all those things. And then obviously, you know, research sort of also affects planning and it's more of a cyclical process. And, and I'm not here to say that this is the best way or, or the only way to represent what happens in the transportation system. But what I would like you to take away from this is that what are sort of the most prominent roles for traffic engineers in this process? I would say design, planning, design have sort of pretty, uh, uh, maybe limited roles, but still pretty significant role. Research, again, traffic engineers have to sort of contribute in the field of research as well. But then what's, what we're going to mostly focus on this class is sort of traffic operation piece. Even within this box, this is sort of going to be the piece that, that we mostly focus on.
And anytime you guys have questions, please feel free to ask those questions. Uh, you know, there are no bad questions as I've said before. It's all, you know, uh, everything is a, a good question for me. So please uh, just never hesitate to ask questions. So, so these are sort of three categories of elements that when you're talking about surface transportation, road transportation, vehicles, highways, road users, right? Those are highways or roadways, you could say, uh, basically move, moving ways where our vehicles are going to move, where our pedestrians are going to walk. So, so I'm saying highway here, but, but my, my, my classification here is much more broader. It's like any place where people move. So it could be highways, it could be streets, it could be uh, your your uh, walkways, uh, you know, uh, sidewalks. Uh, all of those things are part of our roadway network, right? So, so we want to focus on that, and then this is what we are we are designing for. This is what we focus on, and and obviously, because there is so much interplay between, because road users are the ones who are operating the vehicle. Vehicle is on the highway or the streets or wherever. And then highway feeds into how users are going to behave as well. A lot of times we forget this element. We forget this connection that, and I think traffic engineering as a profession has been guilty of this quite a bit. Uh, what, I, what I mean by this is that, is the idea of, you would hear this a lot actually, is, and, and, and remind, tell me, raise your hand if you've heard this statistic before, that something like 90% of crashes are basically human error. Have you heard of that, right? We've all have at least heard some version of that. It's the nut behind the wheel or whatever uh, people people say. And there is obviously some truth to that. Like, you know, you, the so, so the way I would phrase it is this question of what's the link between road user or infrastructure broadly? So I probably should say here, roadway infrastructure instead of just highways and road users. What's the link between these two, right? So if I want to talk about the link between roadways and and uh, and highways and and what's our performance look like? So what does our performance for the roadway look like? The link there is the link there is um, that roadway road users don't make their decisions in vacuum. So let's say, think about this, right? You have a posted speed limit of 30 miles an hour and you start seeing people going 40, 50, 60 miles an hour on that same street. Obviously there is, there is potentially some blame to be cast on the, on the road users for doing that, right? But you also have to think about, is the infrastructure sort of inviting the people to drive fast? Is it? you know, providing a visual environment? Is it providing sort of a environment where drivers are sort of encouraged to speed because they feel safe no matter what speed they drive at, right? So, so, so here is, so the question is, are road users feeling safe, right? Now this has sort of a, pretty interesting implications of feeling of safety. So if road users are feeling safe to engage in the reckless behavior, that means maybe, especially for drivers, right? That could actually lead to unsafe environment on the road. So, right? So we, so, so we have to think about to what extent feeling of safety is correlated with actual safety. So that's the most important connection between how roadways or our infrastructure affects behavior. That affects behavior by providing you with a feeling of safety versus unsafety, right? F feeling of safety versus feeling risk. If you think you can drive at a pretty high speed, then maybe that infrastructure is too comfortable, gives you a feeling of safety, but it's not actually safe because then you yourself might be at risk you might be putting other road users at risk as well, right? So, so, so when, so this road users feeling safe, the question you were to ask is which road users, right? So, so this is the question you want to ask. So, so there is some research that has concluded recently is that when you provide infrastructure where 
sort of more vulnerable road users like uh, pedestrians, bicyclists, if they feel safe, actually you look at and find that the, on those types of roadways where vulnerable road users feel safe, collisions are actually fewer collisions happen, right? So, so their feeling of safety correlates well with actual safety, right? But then for the drivers, if the drivers feel too safe, then their feeling of safety actually does not correlate with real safety in terms of collision experience, in terms of crash experience. And that's pretty interesting to me because again, you know, it depends on context. You don't want to design curves where they're all too tight and, and then drivers are pretty uncomfortable all the time, uh, especially if it's a rural area. You want to provide curves that are that are of large radius and they can navigate through. Uh, again, you know, speed sort of is somewhat of a priority. You don't want to provide tight curves at a certain location. You want to provide some forgiving road environment. But if you start doing like these wide lanes, these uh, places where drivers feel pretty safe going as fast as they can on city streets, then you might be inviting trouble because you know you want to be able to serve the infrastructure for other road users as well. You want infrastructure to serve all road users, at least in certain environments. So, so it's very interesting. And, and I'll kind of talk a little bit about one experience that I had here uh, pretty recently. We did some research project and um, and I want to talk a little bit about that research project, which relates directly with this. Uh, how many of you have heard of edge lane roads? Anybody's heard of edge lane roads? One, two, okay. So I want to talk a little bit about edge lane roads. So edge lane roads are pretty interesting because what they are is I'm going to try to see if I can draw those out here. Uh, So, so edge lane roads are pretty interesting is because so they are they're used as a treatment in place of traditional two lane roads, right? We know all what traditional two lane roads are like, right? Traditional two lane roads are basically you have uh, pavement marking, you have eastbound traffic separate from the westbound traffic. One direction, one, one lane is used by eastbound traffic, the other lane is used by westbound traffic. But what edge lane roads do is where there is not enough right of way to provide dedicated bicycle facilities or vulnerable road user facility, they implement a system like this where we, we provide these two edge lanes on the side. Okay. So these two edge lanes and Obviously, those markings are straight, right? So those are not. We don't crook, purposely mark them crooked. It's just my handwriting there. But you provide these two edge lanes on the side, and then you sort of ask the road users going in both directions to, to share the middle lane, share the center lane. Right? Now, what I want to think, want you to think about is. What makes this type of a treatment so unusual? Okay, I'm going to look for some other folks to respond to this. Okay. What, what do you think makes uh, some of these, or this particular treatment so unusual? Yes, please. Yeah, if you're driving on it, you'll feel less safe because now you're thinking, I'm not used to expecting traffic, oncoming traffic when I'm driving, right? And obviously, that's the question that you wanna uh, you wanna be sure that you know that that's gonna that's a problem for drivers, right? Like if you're expecting oncoming traffic, then then you're not feeling safe, right? You're not you're not gonna feel safe, and then that's that's an issue in a lot of ways. And then, but what we found is that when we an actually analyze collision data, historical collision data, with sort of sophisticated statistical methodologies that you'll learn in CES uh, 526 next quarter if you were to take it in traffic safety class. But, but whatever HSM Highway Safety Manual tells us how to evaluate safety performance of a certain treatment, when we applied those methods here, what we saw was that you see a reduction of collision in the range of 40 to 50% on these edge lane roads compared to your traditional two lane roads. Now, this is interesting because and, and that's accounting for AADT, 
what happened to traffic, if some of the traffic that got diverted or whatever, accounting for all of those using the statistical methods. And, and my best guess for that is, what do you think is your best guess? Why do you think collision would go down on, on those streets? Okay, yes, uh, Vic, go ahead. Yeah, so I think that's part of it is that you would feel more cautious. Yes, you wanna add something? Yeah, drivers simply start avoiding that road and take parallel routes. That that happens. So so we did account for that. So so if you look at the ADT, you know, you, you make sure that there is like you know you account in your model if there was any ADT average tra daily traffic, if that reduced at all, right? So so yeah, so that's another thing. Like you know, so so sometimes that could happen, and you know, collision analysis you have to account for that if the driver just simply avoids start avoiding that route. And, and it'll be interesting to note, like, you know, if the drivers are simply avoiding the road or network wide, now there are more people using, you know, other modes. I think one of those outcomes obviously is better than the others, but, but that's the idea. And then the other thing, the more important thing in my opinion is that now as a driver, you are supposed to be more cautious. Now you are actually feeling a little bit threatened. There might be some, so you're probably not looking at your phone at that point, right? So, so there could be, so again, how we design our, for the longest time, we've sort of thought the behavior is sort of independent of the infrastructure we provide. We let people drive however they want. We have the 85th percentile rule and we say, okay, yeah, so we are going to, uh, you know, whatever the people are going to do, we're going to just sort of look at that. But we, and obviously we're trying to enforce speed limits and all of that. But I think that piece of how can we design infrastructure that encourages safe behavior hasn't been all there. Like it's been like, okay, we're going to provide the infrastructure for high speed and that's fine for certain contexts, but doesn't work very well in other contexts. So, so just that, you know, that connection between infrastructure influencing the road user behavior, we have to always keep in mind uh, of that. You can't just have sort of a nominally safe place where, you know, drivers are doing whatever they're doing and, and, and they're driving as fast as they can or whatever, which is which is not safe. So, so so always remember that connection is that. And then same thing with with roundabouts too, right? Like you know, think about roundabouts. We we design roundabouts, and that's the big difference between roundabouts and your traditional sort of traffic circles. Right? In roundabouts, we provide sort of a speed reduction curve as you're approaching the roundabout. Right. So we make sure that the road is like a little bit curved, which sort of forces the drivers to slow down a little bit. And then once they're, because their entering speed is reduced at that point, then whatever collisions that do occur in the roundabouts are sort of less severe in nature. And that kind of infrastructure is pretty hard to provide if you're talking about a four-legged intersection. The drivers are just sort of zooming past that a lot of times. So, so that's same thing, same idea. And we are actually getting better at that, right? Just kind of reducing speeds by design. And, and, and that's why, you know, something that, you know, traffic engineers, should absolutely be looking to do in the future. There is a lot of places in our infrastructure where this type of strategy has not been attempted, but could be attempted and infrastructure could be made safer uh, in a lot of ways. So, so would love to sort of, if you take away all, so what you need to take away from all of this discussion is traffic engineers exert through design, exert a lot of uh, you know control on how users behave. We cannot always skirt past that idea then it's the nut behind the wheel that's causing the crashes, right? So we, we we cannot always hide behind that statistic. We should not be hiding behind that statistic. We should be trying to provide infrastructure as safe as possible uh, for all road users so that we, we see fewer collisions and not just have an excuse that it's just the driver error or whatever that's causing the collision. Okay, any questions? Yes. The other day I talked to the one yeah. I can ask if anything I would think like the cars are the most effective, like we're the most effective for cars, like the process of that is like the lights and work like the bike lanes, like I guess um like the two way bike path there's the Okay, so if I understand your question correctly, you're you're talking. You observe somebody making a left on a roundabout, 
But was that a car user or a bicycle user? Car user. Yeah. Okay, okay. okay. They just like if it were a bicycle user, maybe you caught me doing that. <laughs> no, I'm just so no, I, I I I would never do that. But the idea is that you know, I think that that question, yeah. So I'm not saying that you know drivers don't make any errors, right? Drivers do make a lot of errors and and this is not to absolve all drivers. So if you're sort of doing that, there's no way you could, you know, prevent all of those wrong way driving that people are doing on purpose. But the idea to me is that if somebody is doing that at that point, hopefully, you know, when, when somebody engages in a behavior that egregious, they're probably looking at very carefully what they're doing, right? So they're probably making sure nobody's coming. So hopefully some of those things are not, you know, I think the, the, the issue that is, you know, most sort of the most crashes happen or most collisions happens and fatalities happen in places where we do something when we are not paying attention to the road and we are sort of not worried about what's going to happen to us. That's when, you know, I think most collisions happen. So, so and, and your next question was like, you know, can we make sure that you know all road users are behaving safely in terms of bicyclists and all of that yeah i think we should probably make sure of that but but the other thing is that we have to also be mindful of the fact that what is the consequences right so so if the if it's a car user that's making a mistake then the consequences are likely to be more severe versus a bicyclist making a mistake right so there is going to be uh for for especially for others right so so if the bicyclists make a mistake then you're talk, probably talking about they're endangering at the like the person that they're most endangering is is themselves and rather than rather than other road users and but for cars that's not the case right so we have to kind of be mindful of that question as well and that's why um you know i'm not it's so there is there has we have to, this is kind of going back to a question of sort of equality versus equity right like you know obviously you want to enforce the law with some sort of equality but then if we focus too much on that, then maybe that's not going to lead to the most safe outcomes. Because again, as a car driver, you endanger more people, more other drivers, other road users, if you are behaving recklessly versus a bicyclist who behaves recklessly, who are mostly putting uh, danger to themselves. So, so that's a, uh, yeah, obviously, you know, we can't have a complete lawlessness in a lot of ways. So that's why I think maybe adapting some of our laws would be useful as well, right? So, so we we should have. So, for example, the one thing that that's going around is uh, uh, um, is Idaho stop, right? So, Idaho stop is sort of a big issue. Um, does anybody know what Idaho stop is? Yeah. You don't. Anybody else know start up? It's not California stop, is it yet? Uh, have they signed it? I, I don't know if the governor has signed it. We keep sending it to uh, not we, but the legislatures have sent it to him a few times, but he keeps vetoing it. But anyway, the Idaho stop is basically. Look, converting all the stop signs on the roads for bicyclists to be yield signs. So you could, you don't actually have to come to a full stop before. And I, I, I like that idea of, uh, and it's Idaho stop and not, uh, you know, it, it's been in force in Idaho. They haven't seen any worse safety outcomes for bicyclists compared to the neighboring states or anything like that. So I think it works because I think it actually minimizes the time that the bicyclists spend in in sort of a danger zone of like where the two roads are meeting, right? So basically, what is what happens is that if you convert the stop sign to a yield sign, and everybody obviously knew about that, then bicyclists can navigate the intersection faster than having to complete stop and then going. And what what the helps with that is that the bicyclists are they the time that they're vulnerable on the intersection of the two roads that gets minimized and i think that leads to more safe outcomes for them uh and but so so that's the question right so we should so in some ways we should definitely consider changing laws uh, changing the processes so we're not sort of and and this is the thing right everybody every bicyclist that i know treats stop signs as an idaho stop by the way right so we see that all the time so that's why sometimes when the behavior is certain certain way it actually helps, you know, to to change the laws completely rather than sort of always, you know, kind of having some kind of a lawlessness uh, in there. So, so this is kind of 
an interesting question. A um, lot of interplay between different factors. Politics comes into play. A lot of different things that go into that that type of a decision making. Um, and so, yeah, so I, I don't think they've quite signed it. I think this year also it passed. Last year it passed. The governor vetoed it. I think this year it passed. I'm not sure if the governor, the governor has been vetoing and signing some bills, so I'm not sure. I haven't quite kept track of what happened to that particular bill this year. Does anybody know? Probably not. But it should be coming. I think ultimately they're going to force his hand and just kind of pass it in a way that, that goes through. So, so I think that will be a good outcome overall So for, for safety. Again, all of these questions relate with how the infrastructure, the highways, inter and roadway users, how they interact with each other. And that's what makes traffic engineering so complicated, so different than other disciplines within civil engineering too, right? Because you are always going to see that uh, nobody questions the judgment of a structural engineer, for example, right? So you, you just don't see that happening because nobody feels equipped to do that, right? Uh, I barely feel equipped to do that, right? Even though I have the civil engineering degree. So because people don't feel equipped to do that, nobody questions it. But then because people are road users, they interact with the infrastructure every day, they feel equipped and emboldened, I would say, to question the road, uh, you know, question the decisions of a traffic engineer. And and that's not to say that we don't make questionable decisions, right? So so again, we, we do make some questionable decisions, and and that's fine if public object to that. But again, there is a there is a line to be drawn somewhere between you know sort of relying on the experts and relying on the road users. And what's that line? That's that's what makes traffic engineering a more complicated profession than even structural engineering. Structural engineering obviously is complicated, uh, quite difficult in a lot of ways, quite challenging mentally. You know, you have to be pretty methodical in how you approach things. But in what makes traffic engineering even more complicated is that obviously you have to be methodical, but even there, you know, you you probably can't account for how all of the road users are going to behave. You try to account for it as much as you can. Right. So, so that's something to keep in mind as you sort of engage in this profession. It's it's easier in some ways, but more complicated. Does that make sense? So it's easier in that our manuals are, you know, based on fewer principles of physics. You have to account for look for different fewer materials, fewer everything, fewer things to track. But then when rubber meets the road. When people actually interact with infrastructure, a lot of complications can happen. So, so it's easier but complicated. That's how I put the, our profession, right? So, any questions? Any any thoughts? Any comments? Make here. So let's see. Okay. So. So transportation engineers have a lot of influence on design and operation of streets and highways, but vehicles and users, we have very little influence, right? Obviously, we can inform the vehicle manufacturer that, hey, yeah, it'll be nice to have seat belts, um, you know, there or whatever, uh, you know, we, because we know seat belts saved lives based on research. So, so seat belts get mandated. That's great. Again, long term thing, but very little to low influence, not as much influence. We probably can't stop. We can provide input to who should get license, who shouldn't get license, automatically renewed, right? Based on the age and, and research on what it tells about reaction times and all of that. But we can't just, you know, make that happen. But in terms of roadway infrastructure, we have a lot of influence, like how we design infrastructure. You know, even, even with a lot of, you know, these manuals, they give traffic engineers a lot of leeway. If you document how you're making your decision uh, methodically, you can you can influence the design quite a bit. There's a lot of ways you can you can play around with that. Even Federal Highway Administration, a lot of sort of these traffic engineering innovations, they start as uh, you know uh, the right to experiment, right? So you can actually request uh, request for experimenting with certain treatments in certain jurisdiction where the Federal Highway Administration will ask you to collect the data, right? So edge lane roads were were like that, right? So in US, they're pretty common in the in the Netherlands, for example, and a lot of the Europe European countries, but in the U.S., they were they, you know, they started as an experiment, uh, experimental treatment, and 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 once you get approved for experiments, you're supposed to collect certain data on collisions or traffic volumes, all of that stuff. Uh, but 
you know. So, so that what I'm trying to say is that even within, given all the volume and all the litigation risk that traffic engineers run into, cities run into, Caltrans runs into, even with that, with all of that, as traffic engineers, we have room to innovate and we should, we should probably do that. We should probably start doing that as much as we can because what we've been doing hasn't been working as very effectively because, you know, U.S. is one of those industrialized countries where collision rates are, or co not collision, I shouldn't say rates, but collision, number of collisions, number of traffic fatalities has been going up rather than down, right? Even, even with COVID and we saw traffic volume reduction and then, you know, there is still traffic fatalities went down. And, and part of that is behavior and people talk about cell phones and, and mobile phones and all of that. But think about this, right? U.S. is not the only country to have mobile phones. I know people will try to blame, yeah, you know, everybody's looking at their phone and yeah, maybe they are. But how come we are the only country? U.S. is one of the very few industrialized countries that is seeing increase in fatalities. So to me, the answer is, what can we do to the design? What, what innovations can we think of in design? So, so that's why I want to highlight that, you know, we have a lot of We have a lot of influence. Um, we have a lot of influence on design and, uh, of uh, streets and highways, and we should be using that influence as much as we can. Um, in vehicle, and, and then there are, you know, not all is hunky-dory, right? We can't control everything. For example, you know, US just has more heavier vehicles in the mix, right? We just have more SUVs in our traffic mix and, and they lead to potentially lead to more fatal outcomes, more injury outcomes, and, and that happens. Again, we don't have a lot of influence on that and we can't do anything about it other than to encourage, have sort of narrower lanes where people are encouraged to drive slowly even if they have a big vehicle, right? So, so those kind of things we should always be looking to exercise. Roadways to accommodate users with various skills and abilities as well as various kinds of size of vehicles with widely varying performance. And that sort of remains the challenge, right? So even though we don't have a lot of control on vehicle, what happens with vehicles, we, you know, we are influenced by it. Our collision rates, our, our, our network performance, all of those things are affected by it. Well, <clears throat> so for vehicle, for vehicles, you know, there are two things that, one is just the physical size of vehicles that impacts our performance, right? So just kind of, looking at the dimension, the weight, uh, the trucks will have weight and then that will impact pavement design. What type of pavement are you putting in? And on that pavement will depend on your skid resistance, right? So uh, what type of pavement you're providing depend uh, will dictate what type of deceleration rate vehicles can generate in wet weather, for example, when it rains. So there is dimensions of the vehicle, weight of the vehicles, those are the physical characteristics, but then there is dynamic characteristics of the vehicles, like you know how fast can vehicles accelerate, right? Now we have these electric vehicles, where you can you're not sort of talking about a gas pedal where the power goes in like slowly, a little bit slowly anyway, right? Um, you know, so there is not, a, but these electrical vehicles have electric vehicles have sort of instant acceleration, right? So they accelerate pretty fast, and and that makes a difference, right? And then you're talking about large trucks. When they're talking, when they are moving on an upgrade, right? You uh, on a highway, you're driving, and you just get behind a truck. It can be a very frustrating experience, and and you know the ability to handle grades, and then up. So when I say grades, it's uphill and downhill, right? So on uphill, it's an acceleration issue for trucks. On downhill, uh, you know there is the deceleration issues for trucks. And have you seen those, uh, you know, the runaway truck ramps on on roadways, right? So what are those basically? If you have a truck that's going on downhill, it can't stop, there is a brake failure. Again, that's that's an important piece of infrastructure, right? We hope we never get to use it or we never have to use it, but we have to provide it to make sure that if a truck runs into a situation where their, their, their brakes are failing, they have an option to be able to stop without doing further damage to in other infrastructure and other road users, right? So again, that's that's based on how trucks work and how you know how they can handle upgrades or downgrades. What are their braking capabilities and on all of that? So, so what we'll talk about is both of these physical characteristics and performance characteristics and how they sort of impact design of the transportation and traffic infrastructure. 
So how does vehicle dimension affect design? How about vehicle weight? So let's look at those questions. <clears throat> so here is the very interesting sort of statistic on, on thinking about cars, passenger cars, even sort of the biggest of your SUVs actually do not damage the pavement that much. Right? Because, and, and we learned that in CE321 a little bit, but but think about, you, does anybody recall the sort of the, the pavement damage formula? Like, you know, how does the weight translates? At least the form of the formula, you don't need the exact formula, go ahead. Weight to the power to the power of four. Four, so it's weight to the power of four, right? It's pretty high sort of uh, exponent on that. It's weight to the power of four. And what that means is that Smaller vehicles, the damage done by as you increase the weight, it sort of grows exponentially. And then you could see that 80 to 85% of the heavy vehicles are legally loaded. So they only damage 40%. They only cause 40% of the damage to the pavement. 60% of the damage comes from heavy vehicles that are overloaded. What are the implications of that for traffic engineers? And I'm not talking about pavement engineers, right? Pavement structural engineers, pavement structure, pavement designers, no. I'm talking specifically for for traffic engineers. What, what are you? What are some? So, what do you? What comes to mind for a traffic engineer to do when you look at this statistic? What What do you think uh, the role of traffic engineer is when you look at this statistic? What's that? Safety is definitely one of those. So yeah, you wanna. Uh, but I'm, here, when I say damage result, I'm talking specifically to the pavement. That makes that increases the cost of infrastructure quite a bit. If sixty percent of damage is coming from these overloaded trucks, what's a traffic engineer? How can traffic engineering, traffic engineering profession, how can they contribute to improving that situation? Any thoughts? Any anything that comes to mind? Love to hear from more people in the class. Anything comes to mind? Yes, please. Uh, minimize the roadway infrastructure where vehicles can travel. I don't know. I mean, you still have to move the stuff though, right? You still want to be able to move our stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, let, let me go with Joey first. Yeah. I would say the opposite. Yeah. Again, but, but it, it does increase the cost. Yeah. Uh, that, that's a possible solution. Yeah. Providing more routes where trucks can travel. Possible solution, but again, increases the cost, yeah. I don't, I don't know if this is really an engineering problem or more of an enforcement problem, but increasing enforcement by increasing amount of way station and to increase compliance with the vehicle. Yeah, so that's a good point, right? So the, uh, uh, the point that was made just now is that if you can sort of enforce this weight limit, right? But their traffic engineers don't have to just rely on enforcement, right? We can sort of help people research technology on way in motion, for example, right? So we could, so instead of having those sort of places where the drivers have to kind of go out of the you know place and then get weight, if you can help infrastructure with equip and equip that with way in motion sensors. And then as traffic engineers, because we know where the trucks are passing through, we can advise the planners or, or whoever the, the agencies into thinking about where to put those way in motion sensors. What are the most strategic routes where we can put them to get the most buck out of most out of your enforcement bucks, right? So these way in motion uh, where the trucks don't have to actually pull over and just drive through, and those would be pretty useful, right? So so then if we can reduce some of that damage, where you know, um, you know, sixty percent is, is pretty significant damage, and, and and not to say that if all of these fifteen percent and trucks were not illegally loaded, they wouldn't do any damage. They'll still do damage, but at least they will. That damage will be much lower because again, of that exponent of four, right? So that's that's pretty significant. As you increase the weight, uh, you know, it's kind of very similar to what we saw in the what we see in our. You know, the link performance functions also are a little bit linked to the power four. If you look at the delay as the demand increases, that's that's the kind of, you know, 
the graph you're dealing with is basically graph goes like this straight line for, for a little while and then just sort of shoots through like that. It goes through the roof and it's the same idea. It's like, you know, the damage is pretty limited when you're talking about uh, small loads, but as you sort of go in there, it's, I mean, I'm drawing a graph without axis, but I hope I'm making the point is where, you know, it's just an exponential increase in damage. And it's the same idea, pretty heavy, hefty increase in travel time as you add cars to the road. So it's kind of a similar curve there that you see uh, in there. So again, so we don't have a lot of control over how many people get overweight, but again, if we can invest in technologies, uh, you know, do some research and, and, and figure out where do you put them, that's a good, uh, you know, that's a good sort of contribution to minimizing that damage and saving some money. Um, <clears throat> physical characteristics, the weight of the vehicle. So this is sort of, you know, your Cuesta grade because we know the the load is going to be pretty high, right? It's uh, um, trucks are going to be heavier, so that means they will have a harder time braking on the downhill. So we basically have a pretty lower speed limit for the trucks. We want to make sure that the trucks are driving at a safe speed, and uh, you know their speed limit is thirty five miles an hour, and and this is a kind of place where you can't do much. You can't actually narrow down the lane because it's not just the trucks who are going. And, and this type of speed limits could be pretty hard to enforce too, because again, it's a downhill. And, you know, so the answer there is pretty complicated. You know, you can't really do much with design there is that you provide the enforcement and then maybe you have a truck lane on the side where the trucks are all alone. Um, you know, they can travel on their own. And if there's somebody... Uh, uh, you know, so that, but but you just have a differential speed limit, and and you probably have all seen it on on Cuesta grade. So this is sort of the map of the area. This is what it looks like. So so why do we do this? Because we are sort of trying to make sure that the trucks are are safe because of their large weight. They they have a trouble stopping on down, right? So let's see. Ah, you've seen all seen that too, right? Yeah. It's again. Implication of physical characteristics. We see this all the time, right? On, on Cal Poly Bridge. Uh, you know, it's surprising how many times does that happen, right? Uh, and our, that railroad bridge coming in on Highland that get damaged all the time. I've, you know, I've been here 15 years. I've probably heard like maybe six or seven, um, you know, collisions between, um, you know, trucks and, and that railroad crossing. You know, that's that's so interesting. Like you know, they they provide the um, the marking. They have sort of all those things, but sometimes you know people are just not paying attention, and that happens. And um, and hope the good news is that when this type of collisions happen, for the most part, they don't lead to fatalities. There's, right? At least that doesn't happen. There is disruption. Obviously, there's uh, loss of property, but at least it doesn't lead to fatalities in most cases. So that's something. Uh, <clears throat> And then what other ways physical characteristics uh, affect our design? Uh, thinking about turn radius, right? So where, um, you know, sometimes you just have to provide a forgiving environment. You just provide sort of a taper on a roundabout where you know the cars are sort of going to go, um, or, or not cars, but the trucks are going to uh, have a turning radius where they're going to get on the curve. You just make sure that, you know, design curve in a way that's not going to damage. So I've seen that. Yeah, you know, somebody had mentioned, Joe, you, I think you had mentioned that roundabout on Tank Farm Road. I've seen like, you know, there's a lot of construction trucks passing through and those trucks would almost always would have to be on the curb, right? Because the they just have that kind of turning radius and you just have to, as a traffic engineer, you have to look at your design vehicle carefully and just make sure about how, what's going to be their turning path and make sure that you provide infrastructure for it. So physical characteristics make a big difference on how uh, you know we design our infrastructure how we design how we design our roundabouts how we design our um, you know uh, intersection turns or whatever so so that sort of leads me to the concept of the design vehicles this depends quite a bit on the physical characteristics of the vehicle the largest vehicle likely to use the facility with considerable frequency again considerable is a matter of judgment uh, but this is sort of the design vehicle we use uh, we don't never we don't ever use so different vehicle types passenger cars 
We almost never use design vehicles as passenger cars. Sometimes in parking lots, especially if those parking lots are a place where, um, you know, where you don't expect. So, so this might be sort of the top of the parking lot, for example, where you don't expect the fire truck to ever having to use it. If, if, if you could do the fire control from outside of the structure, um, then you will probably use, uh, you know, passenger cars as your design vehicle on those parking lots or parking garages. Uh, but for the most part, you don't use um, uh, passenger cars as the design vehicles, right? So that's your <clears throat> buses are sometimes, school buses are usually vehicle design, uh, design vehicle for residential streets. We use them uh, uh, sometimes. Uh, that's always, that's sometimes the case. We always, uh, um, so school buses could be, could be uh, used for design. And again, all of these are specified in the Ashto Green Book. Uh, American Society of Highway and Transportation Officials. They publish a green book, uh, a manual, where the mentions of these, how they turn, their turning radius, their turning templates are all provided in the Ashto Green Book. Um, truck single unit, tractor trailers, articulated vehicles. Uh, for residential streets, uh, we use a single unit truck as our, uh, uh, as our design vehicle. Uh, but then for the major roads and freeways, we use a tractor trailer as our uh, as our design vehicle. RVs, motorhomes, cars as camper trailers, are potentially in recreational areas, so campgrounds. That's where you, you would use these tractor. I mean, these uh, RVs as your uh, design vehicles. So it just kind of depends on the context, right? What what you're using as a design vehicle. So this is sort of the templates that are provided. Now, good news is that. You know, these are the templates that are provided in Ashto, but there are software packages that are available to you. So when you're trying to lay out a roundabout, for example, uh, there are software tools like AutoTurn, for example, um, that are used to then see how the trucks are going to turn. So this is sort of, these types of templates are now integrated within, uh, you know, within certain software packages. So for example, uh, so this is sort of a low speed turn example for a design vehicle. So I'm going to hide this. Right, so this is like different dimensions are provided. And then this is sort of a truck as it's turning. And this is the maximum width you have to provide. So this is a slow speed turn that I'm talking about. Slow speed turns are turns that are made at less than 10 miles per hour speed. So, uh, so that's one type of turn that you need to be concerned about. So this is at intersection uh, where the trucks, the trucks are trying to turn right turn, maybe even making a U-turn or whatever. But then, Sometimes there are high speed turns. So those will be highway curves, for example, where you're not expecting trucks to slow down, but you might still have to provide some sort of widening because the trucks, you know, you might have to provide some sort of lane widening there because when the trucks are go navigating that curve, uh, their back end, their rear end is sort of uh, protruding into the other lane, right? So that's where uh, to keep the things, uh, other road users safe, you might have to widen those lanes on the curvature, on the curve. So, so this example, this picture shows you sort of a low speed turn, but then there could be sort of, even on the high speed turn, you might have to do some lane widening just to account for the turning movement uh, of the truck, right? So you have to be, uh, you know, looking at that. And again, those types of templates nowadays are implemented into the software. Uh, so, so you have just have to kind of learn how to use those software packages and, and, and just apply them. They're not very complicated to use. They're just basically, uh, pretty simple, straightforward type packages. <clears throat> so these are different design school design vehicles, height, width, overall, overhang, uh, typical kingpin center center. So these are all the characteristics that are important. And you can see that for school bus, interstate semi-trailer, and then there is, uh, I think there is single unit truck on the top there. So those are the three, the ones that are sort of three or four, uh, Conventional large school buses, depending upon which is used by the local school district. So these are the four. So if you sort of look at these four design vehicles, you would probably cover most most road width infrastructure. Yes. No, that's more common. It's like would fire trucks typically trunk in from school buses or residential street designs? That's a good question. I think the fire trucks, the way because the My, aerial ladder trucks are no longer than 36 feet that you need bus. Yeah, that's that's a good question. Yeah, you obviously want to make sure that you know your fire trucks can go in there 
But again, those large fire trucks, if you're talking really about the community, like, you know, what community um, is, is there? I, I don't see the fire truck on, on, on this list, right? Fire trucks are all order to right. expect, so they're all different. Right, right. And that that's a challenge too, by the way, right? You know, uh, one of the sort of the challenges of implementing complete streets and all of those things is sort of, what do we do about the fire trucks? You know, because everything is bigger in the US compared to most other countries. And, and uh, you know, maybe that's one thing that, you know, we need to kind of work towards and that, you know, we, we don't always end up over designing our infrastructure in a lot of ways. So, so that's something that we have to think about. But I think in most places, they would have certain smaller fire trucks rather than, you know, so because as I said, you know, in a lot of neighborhood type design, they would probably, uh, <clears throat> you know, design their infrastructure with sort of large school bus in mind, maybe even a conventional school bus in mind. That's that's where how the neighborhood streets, most of them are designed for. And then fire trucks would have at least some equipment that is available to go for that fire if that happens to be the case, right? So, so that's how I think most cities and uh, sort of go around doing that. Because again, designing everything for these very, very large fire trucks could lead to sort of over design as well, right? So, so sometimes it's just cheaper for the fire department to has to have some equipment that can then I can actually deal with that. So that's a great question uh, that you know we have to be aware of is that you know does our fire department have the infrastructure to deal with fires like you know how we are designing, especially you know when you have the new neighborhoods coming up. So yeah, good question there. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> um, so who's at fault? We talked about, uh, you know, is it the road user? Is it the designer when, when some things go bad, right? Who's, who's at fault? And yeah, I mean, that's just uh, a complicated question in a lot of ways. And, and the city agencies that the, the Caltrans, you know, the agencies get sued all the time. And that's, you know, the fault is a very complicated question, right? But I think what Roadbed use road uh, designers have to do is provide infrastructure that's as safe as possible, right? So we we talked about this, right? You've clearly specified that this is the clearance, but but then the the road user still hit the the curb, right? So who's at fault? I would say, you know, if you are in a situation, but maybe there is not enough advance warning there, right? Maybe the warning has to come that you know once they get to that decision point on their routing that they cannot avoid this uh, piece of infrastructure anymore, they should be, you know, told to be turned around. In most cases they are, but if they're not, then, you know, that's a problem with the design, right? So, so we have to make sure that road users don't end up in a situation like this. So, so the way I think about sort of assigning blame for a crash or collision on road users is that, it's not that the road users are causing 94% of the crash. Maybe a more accurate way to put it is that road user action could have prevented that crash 94% of the time, but we can't expect them to take that action all the time. Right? So something to something to think about there. Let me clarify. So we provide as much forgiving environment as we can and then believing that, yeah, so there would, there, there would be some user errors at the end and, and, and you know, you, you, there's not everything. You, you won't be able to avoid everything. So. And then, so this is the physical characteristics of the vehicle. Now let's talk about the dynamic characteristics. So basically those are acceleration and deceleration rate affect a lot of different design elements, right? Uh, how does it affect the transportation network? Where do we need to consider? So think about the dynamic characteristics of track, how they accelerate, how they decelerate. And we've already given you some examples, but but can you think of more examples of where that would directly impact the decisions you make as traffic engineers? Okay, I'm going to look for other folks to, to be able to answer here. Or are there places 
where we can see the impact of dynamic characteristics of vehicles and how they might impact design. I would love to have somebody new answer, try to at least answer. Yes, please. Yeah, the on ramps a perfect example, right? So when you're getting on from on ramp, you know, you're probably on a city street going 25, 30, 35 miles an hour. You're trying to get on a freeway where the speed limits might be 65, 70 miles an hour. The traffic might be going at that speed. So, yeah, you know, what should your, how long your ramp ought to be? Do we need to provide additional, if you can't provide a longer ramp, do we need to provide acceleration, deceleration, I mean, there's lanes on the, on the freeway. So yeah, that's a great, great point. Great example. Um, you know, where do we provide passing lanes, right? Uh, or or this uh, slower vehicle keep right type of lane, uh, uh, that's directly related to, uh, you know, how fast vehicles can accelerate or decelerate. We already talked about the on ramp right here. Yes, please, Max. Right. Yeah, so the pedestrian crossing, the light has to be visible from a certain distance. Uh, and then, you know, you have to turn the light red. And then on traffic signals or even on the pedestrian signals, wherever, all of our yellow light and all red intervals, those are also based on what kind of deceleration rate a vehicle can generate, right? So those are yeah great examples, again, uh, of how acceleration, deceleration characteristics of vehicles impact impact what kind of uh, uh, infrastructure we are going to design, for sure. So this is sort of an acceleration of passenger cars, for example, right? where we expect passenger car traffic. So, so this is a chart where your uh, speed reached with a certain length of distance traveled. And obviously, these are a little bit older charts now. And even the newer manuals, I mean, they don't account for the acceleration now these uh, newer electric vehicles can generate. These are mostly, these studies are all based on sort of gas vehicles, right? So gas powered, uh, uh, basically ICE vehicles, inter internal combustion engine vehicles. But you could see that if you are traveling speed that you can reach, so if you're starting from 35, you, you're at 35, and then that's your speed reached at after you've traveled 600 feet. So you could go from 35 miles per hour to about, uh, give or take, 53 miles an hour in about 600 feet. So that's how you read this chart. Okay. So I'm going to ask you a question here. Okay. So from, so the question I have for you is distance needed to get to 60 miles per hour from 35 miles per hour. How much distance do you need to go from 35 miles per hour to 60 miles per hour? This is acceleration characteristic, okay? So what I wanted to do is like, just maybe write it down, look at this chart and see if you can write it down on a piece of paper on your on your desk, please, on, on your, in front of you, or, or maybe at least have thought about it in your head. Love to see you write it down. So go distance needed, to go from 35 miles an hour to 60 miles an hour. Okay, so let's just write it down on our on our pages, wherever you're taking notes. By the way, you, you can take notes and you're welcome to it. I think that's great. But all the notes of all these slides are available online, okay, as Google Slides. So you could always access those slides anytime. Okay. So hopefully everybody can, can read this chat. You know, that's another thing about traffic engineering, right? We, we, all these complicated questions, user behavior, all that. A lot of the actual work of traffic engineering is reading these charts too. So, so make sure that you can read those charts clearly without making mistakes. Uh, so let's think about that a little bit. So I'm going to go and go back to my spotlight. So I'm starting at 35. So this is the curve for 35 miles an hour. The acceleration characteristic said this is going to be my speed profile moving forward. And I want to get to 60, right? So this is the 60 miles per hour line. So the speed, uh, the length that I need, the distance that I need to get to 60 miles an hour is going to be, so 60. So where the 35 miles per hour curve intersects with 60 miles per hour line. 
So, so I would be over here somewhere, right? So about a thousand feet, is that what you got? Or am I looking at it correctly, right? So that sort of is, obviously it's an interpolation. I'm just reading curve here, but so about a thousand feet. So you can, a lot of time, this is the chart that we use to figure out how long our acceleration length has to be, the deceleration length and so forth, right? So that's that's how you approach it. And again, this doesn't mean we can always provide it, right? We, we, we can't always provide it and, and that's okay. And, and maybe we provide it, but then our infrastructure might change. For example, think about this, right? And I've been sort of harping on this point that our city streets have to have sort of lower speeds. Uh, city arterials even have to have lower speeds, but our freeway is going to be high speed. But what happens when you're designing that interchange or that acceleration lane? Now, maybe maybe you designed your acceleration lane based on distance needed to get from 60 miles, get to 60 miles per hour from 35 miles per hour. But what if you provided some nice, very nice complete street infrastructure and now you made that street because you narrowed the lanes, um, you know, you put some barrier, you protected the bike lane and now, or maybe, uh, you know, you protected the bike lane and you now have Instead of 30 miles, 35 miles per hour prevailing speed on the city streets, you brought it down to 25. And that's great. Everybody's happy. Maybe the city road users are happy. But then now your acceleration lane doesn't work anymore because people can't go from 25 to 65 using the on ramp and the acceleration lane that you provide. Right? Yes, go ahead. Is this the common mitigation measure to, in that sort of case, is to over design or? Over design for the acceleration or deceleration distance, such as say, for instance, the design speed is 45 miles an hour, you would design like your deceleration lane length for 55 miles an hour. Right. Well, yeah, definitely we, we'll do that. So, yeah, so freeways are almost always over designed, right? So, if you're talking about sort of limited access facilities, they're always over designed. So, yeah, that's that's always the case. You know, your, your freeways are always going to be over designed. Uh, but in some cases, the the location might have some limitations. For example, what we have in San Luis Obispo quite a bit, right? We, we our acceleration ramp and now. So going back to the point of like, you know, complete streets and, and freeway infra infrastructure where they intersect, where they interact with each other, that could lead to some conflicts on what we are trying to do. Is like if you provide complete infra infrastructure, and that's why it's such a problem to have sort of freeways right in the middle of the cities, right? So, so even if you change, try to change your sort of arterial infrastructure, your city street infrastructure, that could cause problems for the freeways that are running right through your city. Right? That that's an issue, something that you know we haven't come, fully come to terms with, and and that's why you start to see these these movements to sort of removing complete uh, you know removal of freeways from the city streets and sort of designing bypasses. The, where the freeways are sort of going to bypass the city. So not everybody who's coming into the city is taking the car or whatever, you know, maybe, you know, they, they take some other mode or sort of, uh, or if you can, if you absolutely have to come into the city you come, and you drive to the city, you're driving at a slower speed through an arterial rather than a full fledged freeway. So you start to see that, you know, funding being available to not have freeways right in the city centers. And, and that's part of this is sort of governed by these types of challenges where you know changes in infrastructure might sort of render whatever infrastructure you're already provided sort of insufficient uh, for for the times and and that's always an interesting challenge yes please so are these trucks developed from like a strict so usually those will be sort of your 85th percentile worst case so if you're talking about fastest moving vehicle so these will be sort of 85th percentile slower moving vehicles, like, you know, yeah. uh, so 15th percentile acceleration rates would be, but typically that's the case. Um, so, so that, you know, we design a little bit more conservatively, uh, but yeah, so there, so when in doubt, we use sort of the more conservative, uh, more conservative design. So, so when we're talking about speed, uh, you know, we, we assume the drivers are going to fast. So we, we go with the 85th percentile. When we are talking about acceleration, then we say, you know, We'll assume that you have the slowest possible car and then you know you deal with the 15 percentile um so yeah so that's a good question as well right so how do we 
So is this average or which end of the spectrum it is? It's the more conservative end of the spectrum usually is the right answer. Okay, let's see next slide. So yeah, so we've already talked about examples. So we don't have to worry about this. So, so same way you can you could you should be able to figure this out looking at the chart. Okay, so this is again, you know, eight hundred feet. You can figure out. Eight, is 800 feet enough for this roadway? If I go to the previous slide here, you can figure out whether or not 800 feet is sufficient for us to go from 25 to 55. It looks like it might be, right? Because uh, if you look at the 25 miles per hour curve, which is this gonna be this one, and at 800 feet, you will be able to attain about 55 miles an hour. So in this example, in this example, 800 feet of curve uh, of the ramp length might be sufficient to go from 25 miles per hour here all the way to 55 miles per hour of these. Yes. In a case like that, where it's a grade separated interchange, would we also account for grade in terms of acceleration? Yeah, yeah, that's that's a good question as well, right? So this is going to be pretty significant grade. Then that yeah, you have to account for that, and you have to probably look at the chart. So this is this chart is probably what I'm showing you is for the level grade. But you might have to, you know, almost always these freeways will be grade separated. So you have to look at the chart accounting for those appropriate grades. So there would be uh, some charts that, that account for that. And you have to look at that. That's a great point as well. Uh, because in the upgrade, the acceleration is always going to be slower. Uh, San Luis Obispo. Yeah, I mean, we have some old infrastructure, not modern design. So so some of these ramp lengths are like, you know, 350 feet of length, right? So, so in 350 feet, you can't. You can't possibly go from whatever the speed limit is here. So you see a lot of conflicts actually uh, that happen on these roads. And there has been some talk uh, over the years of sort of eliminating some of these ramps. And, but again, you know, it's it's hard to close down the ramps because they provide such easy access to, to a lot of people. But uh, but yeah, it's not, it's not ideal uh, what happens here in terms of conflicts and so forth. So there's a lot of weaving happening. Uh, people are trying to merge at us and coming in at a lower speed. But I think part of it was what helps is that you know now people have a little bit faster cars, so that helps a, a little bit. But but again, the distances are just so very small, going from uh, larger speed to smaller speeds. Uh, some of the other dynamic characteristics those are related to, um, you know, trucks. How the trucks behave. I'm going to go ahead and stop over here. So in the next class we'll sort of wrap this lecture up and maybe work out some example problems here uh, in the class. So we'll kind of work out on lecture one and lecture two, and then work out some example problems. I'll make these slides. These slides are already online. And I'll try to post the lecture video online as well. But I hope, so just in case you need to go back and look at something. Uh, but I'll see you Thursday. You have your lab on Wednesday. Uh, Professor Howard will be there uh, in the lab. So, so talk to him. And we'll try to keep those things in sync as well. So thank you again. Uh, I'll see you Thursday.